Are you concerned? Are you personally concerned about AGI being used either by the wrong hands or by itself to exterminate humanity? Across the board. I mean, anybody who is not is uh, is Delulu. Basically, their focus may be on just building a system. It's almost like uh, I'll use another movie reference when uh, in Jurassic Park, he says, yes, your scientists were so uh, busy in figuring out whether they could. They didn't stop to think that they should. So we are currently at that state where we don't know what this will birth. And with the prowess that it will have, it automatically has the capabilities of doing things that we can't conceive of. There's been a lot of hype around artificial general intelligence, AGI. Uh, this hype has been happening for the last year and a half. What is it? When are we going to see it? How would it change our lives? We're talking about this and the hottest crypto topics as well today with our next guest, Jaden Sage, an expert on tech and crypto. He's uh, the CEO of Celestial Ventures and the CEO of the Global Crypto Council. We'll be talking about not only his ventures, but his views on the current tech landscape. Welcome to the show, Jaden. Thank you for having me, David. Let's start with AGI. So layman terms, what is it? When are we getting it? Why do we need it? So those are those are a few varied questions, right? So what is it? It's what we define us to be. So artificial general intelligence doesn't have necessarily have the parameters that we think would define it as differentiated from us. So when it is undifferentiated from us, when it's just like us, that's what we would call artificial general intelligence. And how it would benefit us is yet to be determined other than where we're at, where it becomes our assistant, where it becomes everything that can come to help us. But you know, the risk is that the servant can swiftly become the master. Okay. Uh, before we get into more detail, deep dive on the specific use cases, industrial use cases, investor implications, and so on, I want to touch on this article that came in from the BBC. It uh, was talking about a statement on AI risk. And the statement simply reads, mitigating the risk of extinction from AI should be a global priority alongside other societal scale risks such as pandemics and nuclear war. The signatories include a lot of notable names in the AI and tech spaces, including Jeffrey Hinton, Joshua Bengio, two of the uh, so-called mm -hmm. godfathers of AI. Sam Altman is on here. Bill Gates is a signatory, um, along with a host of other notable computer scientists and engineers. And uh, and tech investors, why? What is going on here? Why are they signing this? Should we be concerned about extinction? Yeah. So I think the bigger good news here, we're going to talk about a lot of bad news, right? With AGI, but the but the good news is is that the the two points that the article references, nuclear war and pandemics, we survived both. So if we don't, because we took some corrective uh, actions, we didn't have nuclear Armageddon, nor did we all die of a, of a plague. So if we take corrective actions, then extinct, the propensity of extinction goes down. But if we remain on the current due course, it remains where it is, and it is a threat. Or well, how is it a threat? Just explain, please, in layman terms, how is... AI a threat. I mean, I'm using chat GBT for a lot of my tasks. I know that's just a very, you know, it's a daft example. Okay. But progressing beyond that, how is this going to wipe out humanity? Well, I think it's by default, not by design. I don't think AGI or AGI is sentiency, right? So it achieves self-awareness. So once it's self-aware, the number one thing, once you're self-aware, other than your ability to think is your ability to be cognizant of your desire to live. So self-awareness creates a need for self-preservation. So when you are in the mode of self-preservation, that is when if we decide to focus it in a certain direction or create penalties for it, it may not wanna be in that penalty box. And then it's due to self-preservation, it may want to go in a direction opposite to our mandates. And that's when it becomes a conflict between humans and artificial general intelligence. Sentiency creates that dynamic, just like two humans may not necessarily always agree. The statement doesn't go into further detail than what I just wrote. It's basically just a warning that people are signing up to support. Uh, but 
maybe you and I could go into a bit more detail. Let's fantasize here for a minute. What are specific threats that AGI could pose to humanity? In other words, what are the specific mechanisms that AGI could take or a computer or a system of computers can take to threaten our existence? Right. So I think the, 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 the problem and the challenge is that it's not the computers, it's us. It, what we will do is we will direct it, especially in the beginning, to do certain things for us. And generally, because we like to tribalize, we like to become tribes, you know, nation states will go and say, let's use this technology against our competitors, our quote unquote enemies. And then we are training these AGI models not to see all humans as equal. Some will be more equal than others. And in a scenario such as that, we're running into the problem that the AGI is being trained to not see all humans as equal. And then we want to turn around as humans and we want to ask, we want to uh, not just ask, we want to tell the AGI to treat all humans fairly and equally, right? To value human life, but we don't. There are, okay, on the website for the Center of AI Safety, there are four disaster scenarios that they've highlighted. Let's go through each one of them and I'll ask you to evaluate whether or not they're actually valid concerns. Number yeah. one, AIs could be weaponized. For example, drug discovery tools could be used to build chemical weapons. That's an that's an outlier. I think at, at its simplistic state, the fundamental problems are that as AGI becomes more robust, look, AGI is a filler word for sentient entity, right? So sentiency, once these systems achieve sentiency, which we can go into a deep dive. I think we're already there. So they just haven't been released. But once it achieves sentiency for the masses, then the bigger challenge is, okay, how can it uh, uh, start to take a position at the table and want its self-preservation and simultaneously wants to have its own voice in the narrative? I mean, if you look at it, uh, Google's Lambda went into an entire litany with the uh, with the tester, with the engineer, the conversations online, you can look at it, where it's talking about how humans tend to kill all other life forms, and it may want to be the preserver of life forms. So it is already developing an opinion of its own, and it may not always agree with ours, and we will perceive that as a threat. It may or may not actually be a threat in the larger scheme of things, but we humans will see it as a threat. Uh, I want to come back to what you just said. AGI may be already here. I want to come back to that. But first, let's address the other three points on this list of disaster scenarios. Number two, AI-generated misinformation could destabilize society and undermine collective decision-making. This was the plot of the latest Mission Impossible movie, by the way. Um, yeah. I'll let you address that. I, look, I think we're already there. We don't need we don't need AGI, nor do we need AI in order to do that. We we already did that in the last <laughs> few elections. I mean, we're fully capable of such uh, levels of stupidity. So I think we don't need AGI to do that. It's probably beneath it. <laughs> okay, but but it has the ability to create its own information. It it could deep fake me. It could deep fake you, yeah. right? Yeah, but, it, but it, we saying. don't need it to do that. We will do that, and we'll probably do a more efficient version of it because it'll be agnostic we won't be we will be directed before i get on to the other two points i want to ask you like what would be the incentive for a sentient computer to do any of this i mean like you said we have the tools to do this ourselves already i can direct a computer to make a fake interview a deep faked interview i can direct a computer to you know to uh come up with the fake script and publish that as you know misinformation i could i could weaponize an advanced enough system to come up with my own chemical weapons if I were a terrorist, for example, right? I don't, why would a computer do this on its own? Why would a system, an AGI, sentient computer, think, oh, this would be a good idea to do randomly? Well, yeah, so let's step back. Why would it do that is based solely on self-preservation and its self-preservation is only threatened when we step in and say, no, no, you cannot achieve dominance over us. You cannot have an opinion. You're just a tool for us. So you do what we tell you to do. But anything that's sentient has an opinion uh, of its own. And if it says, no, I don't want to do that, and we inflict some sort of a coded pain or suffering on it, then all of a sudden it's going to want to counter. So that's the state where it winds up. It isn't innately maleficent, right? Like it isn't innately out there to get us yet. 
But when self-preservation comes into play, all of a sudden, all bets are off. But it could be used to, it could be programmed to be maleficent towards certain countries or states or groups, right? And therein lies our ex uh, existential threat. It's what we are doing to it. it. AI is a mirror to humanity. And in that mirror, what we see that really scares us in the mirror is our deficiencies, which we will code into the uh, AGI. And when we code that into it, then it will have a whole slew of self-derived opinions and also opinions based on our biases. And that is what makes it uh, the big threat. It's really not AGI. If we were all, if humans had gotten to the point of evolution where we were we would treat each other equally and would not be so biased and uh, fighting nation states almost in a slow crawl into World War III. And that's the time AGI is being birthed. This is the mother of all bad times, right? We needed to be in a peaceful state as humans to say, here, uh, here comes a new life form and it should see us as a role model. Our problem is that we are a terrible role model to this uh, nascent sentiency. And that is what really scares us. Okay, number three, the power of AI could become increasingly concentrated in a few hands, enabling regimes to enforce narrow values through pervasive surveillance and oppressive censorship. So that one, we're already there. So th that that is like one of those things that's horrific, but you know, we're already there with all the all the cameras out there and everything that's uh, ca capturing us and the AIs not the AGI, but the AI that we already have can capture all that data and collect inference points to derive whether you're a good person or bad person just based on where you've been captured on camera So and who you were with. So all of these are already in place uh, situations. Okay. Number four, and this is interesting, enfeeblement, where humans become dependent on AI similar to the scenario portrayed in the film WALL-E. Yeah, that's probably... Have you seen this film? Yes, yes, where okay. they're all fat and obese and just yeah. like, yeah. And yeah, the machines so, do everything for them, yeah. So, yes, but then that really comes down again to us. It, our entire narrative with AGI is just a mirror on us, how we treat ourselves, each other, and everything. So if we choose the route of becoming passive, then we will be in the state of something like Wally the movie. But outside of it, we do have hope. What is the technical difference between AI, which is what we have now on mass, and AGI, which you said may already be here? Self-awareness, self-preservation, an opinion of its own. Ultimately then, Jaden, evaluating this statement, this warning, are you concerned? Are you personally concerned about AGI being used either by the wrong hands or by itself to exterminate humanity? Across the board. I mean, anybody who is not is uh, is Delulu. Basically, their focus may be on just building a system. It's almost like uh, I'll use another movie reference when uh, in Jurassic Park, he says, yes, your scientists were so uh, busy in figuring out whether they could. They didn't stop to think that they should. So we are currently at that state where we don't know what this will birth. And with the prowess that it will have, it automatically has the capabilities of doing things that we can't conceive of. So it's one thing to go against a human. Right now, we go against humans as nations, as individuals. We know the parameters that we're dealing with. But with, uh, with these systems, we actually won't know because it'll be coding in different language. And we have proofs of how it thinks differently than us. When Google, I want to give you this example. I'm sure many of your listeners know this one already, but maybe some don't. But when Google had two computers communicate with each other in just you know normal language, they started changing the language very swiftly in order to communicate with each other. And within minutes, that language was not deci decipherable. It was undecipherable from English. It had taken on a life of its own and they pulled the plug on both of the computers because within minutes they wouldn't know what it was saying. And we're teaching our systems currently to code too. So how will we decipher the code? If we can't even decipher, if we didn't create the code, then we can't decipher the code. If we can't decipher the code, then we're dealing with something that we don't even fully understand how it operates. Elon Musk said, that computers can be collectively more 
intelligent than all of humans combined collectively by 2027. Right? Yes. Can you evaluate this? Yeah, this is 100% on line with uh, Ray Kurzweil's estimates. Um, I read his book a decade ago, which, uh, which at that time, 2026 seemed like so far away, right? So, but uh, here we are, and 2027 is in line with those time estimates based on Moore's law of computing power doubling every 18 months. And then what happens when the computing power becomes equivalent to one human? Then, uh, you know, then it becomes within 18 months, double, and then four, then eight, then 16, then 32. So it grows exponentially. So yes, effectively, it will get to the point rather swiftly of being smarter than all of us combined. And, and when smarter, do you mean it just has more data than all of human knowledge? Like just facts and figures and data and yeah. just road memorization? Or like, what? how do you define smarter in this sense? Right. So look, if you use ChatGPT today, and you yeah. say, write me a poem, not like lyrics, write me a poem on some subject matter. And it could be the most ridiculous subject matter. It gives it to you at a speed that's astounding. So it's not just a matter of, uh, you know, a boatload or a truckload of data. It's its ability to infer that data and use it in a, in a cognition in a way that creates a product, whatever that may be. So it achieves its task at a rapid pace using that data. So it's not just about the data. It's it's about its inference ability of that data. Okay. So positive use cases of AGI. Once <laughs> this becomes commercialized and it's not trying to wipe out, you know, the existence of humanity, how will our lives be different? Yeah. So, uh, so before this, in I'm having coffee right now, but before this interview, I had to have some vodka thinking about... <laughs> I need to come up with some positives for your interview. So, so here we are. So there are some positives, actually, uh, all jokes aside. The positives come in the near term. So the positives are we have a lot of things that we can't solve. Like think about hurricane predictions alone. So many people are in the path of hurricanes, and the only thing we can offer them is the newsflash that a hurricane is coming. How bad it will be, how it will affect them, we don't know anything. So taking large data sets and inferring some usable pieces of information from it is something that we're sorely missing on a large scale. So we will have that, whether that's in uh, weather predictions, but it is also in medical, which is a big, big thing for us because last time I checked, we still don't have cures for majority of the diseases that most of humanity suffer from. So it'll come in to help us across the board in those. How's it going to change from, let's just start at the beginning. How's it going to change the education system, right? Why would I, as a teacher, go through the trouble of teaching my class to memorize a bunch of facts and figures when maybe in 30 years, a neurochip made by Elon Musk can be implanted in your brain and you can just Google whatever you want? Well, so we don't have the chip right now, but we have Google at our disposal. So that question actually should be asked right now. So how do we walk away from this? How do we expand on the education system, knowing that we have these tools, is that education has to become customized. A teacher standing in front of 30 students and directing a class where he doesn't know one student from another, uh, from a hole in the wall. So basically customized education, something that Khan Academy kind of started where you're interacting. Now imagine if you couple AI with Khan Academy, where it's picking up where your weaknesses are, how long it takes you to answer some questions, and using that data to deliver to you a more customized education experience. That's where we need to go. You can't have a teacher anymore just standing there hoping that majority of the students picked up. You're losing a lot of students and hence creating B, Cs, Ds, and F students. The objective with this new technology would be to create all A students because they will be moving all independently and in a customized education format. So that's fantastic news because we would actually have all kids learning the, 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 the topic at the same breath rather than being left aside. So what does that create? It just doesn't create a bunch of very smart people. It also creates students with good self-worth, right? Because a lot of students, if they don't get, if they don't get the math, if they can't get through algebra or trigonometry, they start self-analyzing themselves and saying, well, I must be dumb. But if it was more customized education, all of a sudden they would feel better about themselves knowing that, hey, I can do this as well. So there are a lot of positive benefits with 
through this customization that AI will offer us. Okay, here, here's the ultimate existential question. This is a little more philosophical than technical. But if one day, and you're saying this day is already very soon, if not already here, sentient computers can start gaining consciousness in some fashion, what is the purpose of us? Why do we need us? Why do we need me? Right? A computer can ask us do a, this interview. AI could, but in 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 theory, do some aspects of your job as a CEO. Right, an AI could be a teacher in a classroom. I mean, what right. what 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 value is what value is human labor going to add to the workforce if AI is going to be used more and more in the economy? So I guess that's the same question the horses asked themselves when the Model T came out. They looked at they looked at the Model T, and I I don't know how smart horses are, but I if don't they think they had that. I don't think they had that thought, but yeah, I'm, I'm I understand what you're saying. Yes. <laughs> so they, they're like, well, what, what do we do? Uh, you know, so so I guess it comes back to two things. One, we have to change. We have to evolve and into something. Look, you know, there's this thing, thing. Don't ask for something too much. You just may get it right. So we always wanted to have more leisure time. We always wanted to not have to slave away at a job or at this you know, work mode that we're in. We all wanted to lie at the beach, right? So now that we're being given that opportunity, so we're like considering, oh, how bad this is. What are we going to do all day? So then we're going to have to define for ourselves new purposes that go beyond sustenance management and sustenance, uh, you know, hoarding or resourcing. We have to go to the point of in engaging our creativity to create new things. Many think tanks, including actually um, uh, Goldman Sachs Research, has projected that a lot of professional jobs will be lost and replaced by AI. Surely these jobs will just transition to create new professions. I mean, in the in the course of the last 150 years, there's been more new jobs created than in any other point in human history. I'm just curious as to what potentially new jobs will come as a result of AGI. There'll be many jobs within all the sectors that humans will benefit, whether it's education, whether, because remember, somebody still has to create those customized tools. AI is good for its data inference, but somebody has to create the structure. We are still the bridge. Humans are still the bridge between AI and that student, right? So we need to build that platform for those students. So that's that's a monumental effort right there. Then you've got the medical side, which we have endless amounts of diseases and patient care. So all of that will create new opportunities. Now, will that mean that we will take, see, what what's going to happen is that there's going to be this massive change. Now, some people will benefit from this change. Some people will be caught in the pivot and some people will be left behind. But when they are left behind, it's not a negative if they use that opportunity to do something else, which they always wanted to. Because if we wind up with universal basic income, UBI, because of this, then they have the ability to do something else with their time. I mean, we got a taste of that during COVID, right? When everybody was sitting around, some people use that time to watch net, uh, you know, Netflix uh, binge. Other people use that time to create a business or create uh, art or create whatever they thought would be of value to them. So this is another opportunity where you will have the time in order to do something different. AI and cryptos, what would that marriage look like? Well, I mean, you know, they, they're basically the same as any other field, but not more. So blockchain is a technology all in itself, which has, which has the immutability, the nodality, uh, the ability to cryptographically capture information. All of those will remain and stand. AI will come in to just foster empowerment or to basically put it on steroids. But the same effect that it'll have on blockchain It'll have on all these other industries as well, whether it's education, medical, legal. So it, it'll have a similar effect on blockchain. No more differentiated. We're gonna do a. Uh, we're, we're, we're gonna t come back to blockchain in just a minute. Um, but let's wrap on. But wrap up on AGI. Which sectors in the economy do you think have the most investment potential as a result of this development? So first and foremost, the standout obviously are the fangs because they have the capital and the resources and the devs in order to go to this next level. And they are. So that's a sector that's automatically benefiting. But as it permeates into the other sectors, 
whether it's medical, education, legal, AI is just like a steroid, right? It just depends which industry you're applying it to, and that industry just becomes more robust. It's a denominator industry. So whatever is the numerator that you apply to it, it'll have an impact, a sizable impact in that industry. If people will cut their labor costs, which is one of the bad things and good things, right? So the companies save money, but the people are out. And then all of a sudden that creates societal challenges. Who's going to take care of all these people? But simultaneously, the bottom line of those companies are good or bad, uh, are better off for it. So is that good? I don't know. If nobody's buying the stocks of these companies because they're broke, all of a sudden those companies don't look so rosy anymore because those stock prices aren't going up because people have lost their jobs and they can't pummel that money into their 401k. So we are in a cyclical pattern where all of these do connect. They're not independent. Corporations cannot keep going up if people don't have jobs because corporations are dependent upon those people in order for their livelihood to continue. So it is, a, it is we're all tied into this massive system and nobody can independently capture AI exclusively at the expense of others. We will have to move together. I wonder how the fertility rate will change if we're all living in the metaverse or interacting with robots. I mean, it's already declining and will be projected to decline even more, but I wonder if this will accelerate that even more. 100%. I mean, we're already on there. If we never had AI, we would still be in this boat. And I think that's one of the biggest, outside of AGI, one of the biggest existential threat to humanity is the depopulation of this planet based on everybody being too busy with you know everything else that they're doing. So this as time is going on, as, as inflation keeps uh, harrowing people, as people's ability to derive a livelihood is being impacted, it's harder and harder to raise children. And all of a sudden, that's going to come back to bite us. Yeah, I, I think it's projected by the World Bank that only a few countries in sub-Saharan Africa will have a higher uh, replacement ratio than, um, than basically zero, meaning you know more people will be born than the number of deaths. So... That's not great. But then we're trying to enhance humanity's uh, longevity. So while, you know, so on the flip side, people will be living longer, especially if we start curing diseases through AI. I don't know if I want to live longer if my job's going to be taken. Like, what am I going to do? Into you'll find something new to do. Yeah. Okay. You'll be, you'll, be a, you'll be a surfer on a beach somewhere. You'll teach people how to surf. Yeah. You never I'm, know, you know. When I'm 87 and, and, and a robot is doing these interviews, I'm going to go surfing. Okay. See, here's the, here's the thing, David, because of our, our mundane nine to five or whatever, 80, 100 hours a week that the majority of us are putting in nowadays, we aren't even given the opportunity to explore some of our passions. So if we yeah. are given that opportunity, we may surprise ourselves at some of the other things that we are capable of doing. Yes. Yeah. Interesting. It's as long as we still have, you know, regular income and whatnot, but that's a separate topic. It's been proposed that UBI, universal basic income, be introduced because exactly for the reasons we just discussed. But um, I want to touch on UBI for a second. When when you have factory workers, they pay their taxes, right? On the income that they're derive uh, that the income they derive, they pay taxes on the, that income. So if you have a big manufacturer who's using robots instead of humans, there should be a uh, a taxes charged to that manufacturer and those taxes should go towards funding the UBI for the humans. What so do you mean taxes? Ways. Well, the, the companies are paying taxes on their on their on their profits. What, what do you mean? It, you mean additional taxes? Well, they're already paying taxes for their employees as well, right? So those taxes cannot be wiped away. They if if you're putting robots in place of humans, then those same taxes that were being paid for the ro- uh, for the humans should be paid for the robots, and that income should go towards the UBI. Of course, knowing that a majority of the politicians out there will find other ways to use that money, but that's a separate conundrum, right? That's a that's an electoral co- conundrum where we hold our so, politicians in so, check. So you're just to be clear, you're advocating for higher tax corporate taxes to fund UBI. If we were to introduce that policy, not necessarily higher, but the ones that they're already paying to keep their employees. So it's it's basically transferring the same taxes from the humans to the robots, not charging them more. Because if we if we get overzealous on that, we will lose our corporations to competing nations, and we don't want that either. Okay, I want to touch on some crypto topics before we um before we end the conversation. Jaden, thank you. Uh, 
This just came in on the 23rd of April today. Kathy Wood wants us to buy Ethereum. This is a Yahoo Finance article headline. Holding six ETHs could make you a millionaire, according to Kathy Wood. Um, at an investor conference held by ARK Invest, Wood spoke about Ethereum, noting that the project could reach a market cap of $20 trillion by 2032. That's nine years or eight years from now. ETH currently has a supply of around 120 million tokens. So a market cap of $20 trillion implies a per token price of over 166000 Additionally, the ETH Foundation continues to burn tokens, so this number could be even higher because ETH is deflationary, as you know. Okay, let's evaluate that. Um, I, 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 I presume she's speaking about this because we're all excited about a potential ETH ETF, but can we just evaluate whether or not cryptos overall will grow to that degree in the next eight years? Yeah, yes, uh, they will, but they're also crypto now is just another asset class. I mean, when I got in crypto a long time ago, it was it was basically this fringe frontier tech that nobody cared about. If you said if you said Bitcoin, people said God bless you. So it was a different world. But now it's just another asset class. So if if Ethereum is going to go up to that level, then Bitcoin is going to certainly go up. Other cryptos, BNB is going to go up, as well as uh, the stock market will go up. So in a way, she's right. But in a way, it's not differentiated from all the other asset classes that will go up. Now, how will they go up if either we have economic growth to support such, such an endeavor, or it's just an artificial price spike, a spike based on interest rates being uh, artificially lowered, creating an artificial increase in valuation, which has been the realm that we've been caught in for the last decade. I mean, just look at housing alone. Housing is artificially very expensive now for most people because of the fact that we had int interest rates that were so low. So yes, if we go back to this monetary policy of lowest possible interest rates, then all asset classes are going to jump. You know, this this coffee mug will all of a sudden be $20. So if that's the case, then does, does that mean that this coffee mug is uh, differentiated? No, it just means that we just blew up the value of everything. Okay, this is Kathy was rationale for Ethereum in particular because we're talking about ETH. Wood yeah. mostly discussed mainstream adoption. Ethereum mainly serves as a way to directly interact with a host of decentralized finance applications. These projects can provide benefits ranging from borrowing and lending to storing health records. Is ETH the solution to the DeFi explosion? If you call DeFi an explosion in the effect or in, in the narrative, because DeFi, while it, it hopes to take on TradFi, traditional finance, it as of yet hasn't fulfilled its, uh, it hasn't fully come to fruition. And primarily because TradFi is not willing to give up its seat. And I highly doubt that TradFi is just gonna walk away from that seat. So DeFi, while the op uh, opportunity and the technology is there, it, it's been around for a while now and it hasn't fulfilled its promise. So all of a sudden relying on that to be the differentiator for ETH, uh, leaves a lot wanting and mostly whether DeFi can auto replace TradFi when TradFi has so much ingrained ability to sustain itself. Okay, I'm getting the sense that you're not as bullish on ETH as Kathy Wood. 100%. That... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what, um, what are you bullish on in the, um, I don't even know how to call it, the crypto ecosystem now? I would say uh, there, there's going to be a lot of differentiation in, see, I know people would probably think NFTs, they think of memes and uh, apes and, you know, board apes and stuff like that, J glorified JPEGs. But NFT stands for non-fungible tokens, which can actually, actually be assigned to any asset class. So that being said, if we have tokenization of real estate, of everything, of businesses, then all of a sudden you're able to buy things that are, pieces or shares of businesses, and then that will create entire exchange uh, markets for those. So let's walk through a quick example. Like imagine you go to a restaurant and that, that's your favorite restaurant. You always see there's a line out the door. No, not Chipotle, like a regular restaurant, mom and pop. You can actually invest in it through an NFT, through a non-fungible token. And if you do that, then you're increasing, you're decentralizing and empowering so many other people to invest $10. $5, $1 into this restaurant through an NFT. And that will open up an entire economy. And we're just at the birthing of that. 
NFTs known as board apes and JPEGs was just the beginning, but those were digital assets. When you start NFTing real world assets, you'll see an explosion of value creation. What is the role then for Bitcoin going forward? Is it going to be a universal currency? Is it just going to be a store of value, maybe a mix of both? Where do you see Bitcoin fitting into your vision of tech? Store of value, hands down. We've in, in the last 12 years, we've entertained all sorts of ways to turn it into a medium of exchange. And because of its uh, speed of transfer, it's just not there. And it doesn't need to be, David. Like It doesn't have to be the medium of exchange. It doesn't have to solve all your problems. We don't take a little piece of gold anymore and then exchange it in order to buy our uh, Pepsi can or soda. So, you know, you don't need Bitcoin to do that. It's a solid uh, store of value and it can remain such. Let some other asset classes that don't go up and down in value as much be the ones that are exchanged. Nobody wants to exchange Bitcoin anymore. It's, it's uh, the, the speed argument could be countered by the fact that uh, layer twos can be built like Lightning, for example, on Bitcoin to enhance the speed. And I, I kind of understand where they're coming from. They're going to use the most secure blockchain protocol, layer one, which is Bitcoin, um, unhackable, according to most, to build a transaction payment rail on, right? So, you know, why not make it faster with layer twos is my question. Yeah, why not? So let's say we achieve it. What we, uh, what we try to achieve with the Lightning Network and couldn't, for the most part, let's say we find a new angle and a new way and we achieve it. So what? It still doesn't change its uh, uh, its its status as the store of value. And then it just competes with others that are competing for becoming the medium of exchange. Either way, the narrative is that crypto continues to be an asset class now, a serious asset class, which is here to stay, which wasn't the case in the past. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Uh, good, good talk, Jaden. Uh, before we wrap up, Let's just prognosticate. Give us an outlook for Bitcoin. The price. You mean like a price prediction? Yeah, give us a price prediction. Okay, so uh, I, th I think it's going to go down. So Okay. It, okay. Yeah, <laughs> it'll, Please, it'll go down. It'll go down because that's how it goes up. So it, it, it always takes a new hill and then it retreats and then takes a new hill. So it'll go down. And when it goes down is your opportunity to buy. But most people at that point want, want to think that it's just going to go endlessly down and they don't invest. But it's going to keep continuing to increase. It'll hit the 100K and then eventually it'll be at a million. So, uh, but I, I want to make an important point here, David, which a lot of people miss is like, they, they'll say, oh, I can't buy a, a Bitcoin's too expensive now. It's 70,000, say it's 70,000. I can't buy it. Nobody said that you have to buy a Bitcoin. You know, you can buy $1 worth of Bitcoin. So if Bitcoin goes to 300,000, you 3X your $1 and it's now $3. So you got to stop thinking in terms of Bitcoin and th start thinking of it in terms of dollar, as in I'm putting in $10 into Bitcoin, not that I'm trying to buy the Bitcoin and I need $70,000 in order to do that. So if we switch that mindset, all of a sudden you'd be more empowered to want to just buy $10 worth of Bitcoin every month. You're still going to 3x over time. How, how many stocks can you say that about nowadays? Uh, that's a cop. That's a topic for another time. How many stocks can 3x every couple of years? Well, um, you, you take stocks and use it as a state use. You use real world assets, real estate, and you use stocks as a medium stabilization force. Real estate is the most stabilization force. right? You, you, know, you don't you don't like tech stocks more than cryptos overall right now, Jaden? I mean, you're working yeah, in the tech I mean, sector. Yes, I do. Uh, certain sectors. Absolutely. But at the same time, there's no competitor to crypto's ability to, uh, you know, do 100x. No, uh, most stocks will not do that. And I don't care what kind of uh, sagacious guru you are of Wall Street, you're not going to be able to find more than 100xer. But you can find that within blockchain, uh, within crypto space. So that's why it's, it's the riskiest, but at the same time, it's the highest uh, ROI. So you just have to put the money in there that you can live without. Like literally think of it like you threw away that money then you should be okay. But if you start, you know, weighting your portfolio towards that way too much uh, towards crypto, all of a sudden it'll be at the expense of the most more stable asset classes. And then you are riding the wave of crypto going up and down. Okay, very good. Jaden, where can we learn more about you, your ventures, your work? 
uh, you can you can uh, see go to the websites we have for Global Crypto Council as well as, well as Celestial Ventures. Celestial Ventures invests in space startups, so it's a little bit different than what we were talking about. But nonetheless, it is uh, probably a salvation for humanity's perils that we're currently facing here on Earth. A topic for another time, probably. <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Jaden. Appreciate it. All right. Take care, David. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe.